Good evening and welcome to the Greek Archaeological Committee 65th lecture. My name is Zeta Theodoropoulou Polychroniadis, chair of the committee and your host this evening. We have a record audience and I thank you all for joining us. Let me please mention some protocols about this evening session. Other than panelists, all cameras and microphones will be off by default. There will be no discussion after the lecture, but you may use the chat button to send your questions. Please write your email too, so that the speakers can respond directly to you by email. After the presentation, the vote of thanks will be given by the renowned academic Robert Parker, Professor Emeritus at New College, Oxford, who specializes in ancient Greek religion and Greek epigraphy. This evening, we are delighted to welcome two distinguished archaeologists, Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou, Director of the Ephorate of Antiquities of the Argolid, and Mr. Haralambos Kridzas, Emeritus Director of the Epigraphic Museum at Athens. The title of the lecture is The Discovery of Bronze Inscribed Tablets from the Treasury of Palace at Argos. But before introducing them to you in a moment, and especially for you who have joined us for the first time, let me please say just a few words about the committee's aims and its work. A British registered charity, the Greek Archaeological Committee UK, was founded in London 37 years ago by the late Mati Egon Xilas. It is the only such institution outside Greece which through lectures and scholarships promotes Greek archaeology for the closer links between British and Greek academia. The committee has since offered two lectures annually presenting the latest archaeological discoveries in Greece and Cyprus. Since 1993, we have granted scholarships for postgraduate studies in archaeology at leading UK universities to 75 Greek and Greek Cypriot students. This year, we are supporting six bright scholars. Our scholars or leading academics in their field now hold prestigious posts in the UK, in Greece, elsewhere in Europe and in the USA and promote the study of the Hellenic cultural heritage through their work. The scholarships are made possible thanks to donations generously made by Mati's daughter, Stamatia and son, Nicholas, the A.G. Levendis Foundation, the Maria Tsakos Foundation and other donors, but also through the annual subscription of our devoted members. As we safeguard Gakuk's legacy, we hope you will join us in our mission, by either becoming a member of our charity or make a one-time donation, which will go towards our scholarship fund. Every donation makes a difference. Please visit our website for membership and donations. And now back to our speakers. Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou, our first speaker, studied history and archaeology at the University of Athens and was awarded her PhD from the Albert Ludwig University of Freiburg in Germany. After having worked for several years at the German Archaeological Institute's excavations in the lower citadel of Tiryns, she joined the archaeological service of the Greek Ministry of Culture, serving as curator in the fourth effort of prehistoric and classical antiquities. A member of the scientific committee for works for the archaeological site and the Museum of Mycenae, and supervisor of the conservation program at ancient Tiryns, both funded by the European Union. She was responsible for the inclusion of Mycenae and Tiryns on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1999. A diligent excavator, she brought to light significant finds in many parts of the Argolid, has organized many exhibitions, and since 2010, she is the director of the Ephorate of Antiquities of the Argolid. With the help of European programs, she has initiated and contributed to the restoration and promotion of several archaeological sites. A corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute, a regular member of the Council of Monuments of the Peloponnese and of the National Council of Museums, Papa Dimitriou is the author of several papers in Greek, English, and German, focusing on the late Bronze and the early Iron Age in the Argolid, 
the area that she has devoted her professional career to. Our second speaker, Harala Moskritsas, a graduate from the University of Athens, continued with postgraduate studies at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes, and the University of Paris. In 1970, he joined the Greek Archaeological Service and served as head of the Department of Archaeological Sites, as curator of antiquities in the Argolite and Corinthia, Athens, and Megaris. He was promoted to effort and director of the Heraklion Museum in Crete, his native town. In 1994, he was appointed director of the Epigraphic Museum at Athens and is emeritus since 2005. His main academic fields of research are classical and marine archaeology, dialectology, and epigraphy. Fritzas, a prolific writer, has lectured widely and has taught at many universities in Greece, as well as abroad. This evening, we shall have the privilege of listening to the results of the fruitful and close professional collaboration of those two eminent archaeologists whose discovery and deciphering of the bronze tablets have shed light to many aspects of the public life of Argos in the fourth century BC. Dr. Papadimitriou. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I'm very pleased to be with you today, even this way. And uh, I would like to express my warm thanks to the Greek Archaeological Committee and especially to Dr. Thodoropoulou and Mr. Karas for the kind invitation. It is a great honor for us to be able to present one of the most important archaeological discoveries ever made in Argos, which remains so interesting to the public even after 23 years since their discovery. As an expression of our gratitude, we prepared a special, a special presentation for you and we wish you to enjoy it. Let me please um, give a personal end note to this uh, greeting. I know somewhere there in Oxford in the University of Oxford in a hall, my best friend, my eternal friend, Professor Irene Stavros Lemos is sitting with uh, her students and they are waiting for us. So I would like to, to thank her and uh, to give her my best wishes and love. Ευχαριστώ, Ereki. President, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, Good afternoon from Athens. I am Haralambos Kritzas, and I feel very pleased and honored that thanks to the invitation of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK, I have the opportunity to communicate with you, even if only online, to present to you briefly some wonderful ancient texts which the land of Argos has given us and which shed new light on the Greek history of the fourth century BC. I wish you good listening. Secrets does antiquity hide in her bosom? When and to whom are they revealed? And what becomes of them when they appear once more in the world of men? Twenty-three years ago, the ancient gods placed in our hands one of the most important archaeological discoveries of all time made in Argos. Time capsules of stone clay and metal, filled with memories written on pages of bronze about the history of this long-suffering city, were revealed to our eyes. And the ancient world found its voice again. Anxiously and ever aware of our responsibility, we skillfully managed to retrieve the fragile finds intact 
from their damp abodes of internment. Amazed at their uniqueness, we respectfully entrusted the heavy burden of their study to a prominent expert, the Greek epigraphist Haralambos Kridzas, patiently preserving, and after long hours of toil, this wonderfully modest specialist deciphered the secrets stamped on the bronze plates. His reward was the pleasure at being the first to find answers to questions that had bedeviled scholars for so many years. Today, following the kind invitation of the Greek Archaeological Committee, UK, we have the honour to present the excavation data. First, we analyse it, and then investigate it, so as to tease out the temporal sequence of the uses of the space. The building plot, belonging to Evangelos Midnaus, is located at 48 Corinth Street, right in the centre of the modern city of Argos. It is a long rectangle, orientated east-west, and measures some six metres wide by twelve and a half long. The first archaeological strata appeared at a depth of 1.80 to 1.85 metres from the present road surface of Corinth Street. Right against the southern side of the plot, at a depth of about 1.95 metres, were exposed roughly hewn blocks of porous limestone, arranged in an ordered and coherent manner. They rested on a substrate of cobblestones. Their orientation was also east-west, and their maximum surviving extent was 9 metres, with a width of 70 centimetres. In the eastern part of the plot, and at the same depth, similar blocks with a width of 50 centimetres sat on a cobbled substrate running on a north-south line and were bonded with a previous line. Their bonding, structure and construction all allow us to recognise in them the remains of two foundation walls. Towards the northern side of the plot, a series of roughly worked limestones and pebbles were recovered, this time without any particular cohesion but on the same orientation. They are preserved for a length of about seven metres. Their upper surface was again at a depth of 1.95 metres, being embedded in the soil to a depth of 2.10 metres. At various points to the north and south of these structural components, at a depth of 1.85 metres to 2.15 metres, concentrations of roughly worked limestone and porous were observed. In the western part of the plot, at a depth of 2.32 metres, a section of an ellipsoidal half was preserved, measuring 1.3 times 0.7 metres. It, too, was orientated east-west. Immediately to the southeast, intact and broken clay moulds were found. This layer contained abundant ash and pieces of burnt clay, and was of a particularly hard texture. This hearth is apparently the residue of a metal melting kiln. Along the central axis of the plot, large limestone slabs, up to 2 by 1 by 0 0.3 metres in size, were uncovered. These were initially considered to be cover slabs for graves. With the removal of the first one, though, it became clear that these were covering plaques, large in mass and rough in appearance. What they concealed were stone containers, carefully worked on their upper surface and interiors. The first stone chest, at the east, had a cover orientated north-south. The vessel itself was almost square and contained no finds. A further stone chest, just east of number one, was not investigated. It lay entirely within the boundaries of the adjoining Delis property to the east, whose owners did not consent to its examination. Stone chest two, to be investigated next, was the third counting from the east. Its cover was placed east-west. On lifting it, we found a large number of inscribed tablets of bronze that had been deposited inside the container. All in all, it yielded 51 inscribed tablets of bronze and two of lead. One lead tablet 
had even been rolled up, initially giving the impression of being a cursed tablet, tabella de ficcionis. Stone chest three, fourth from the east, had a similar cover on the east-west orientation. It had no finds inside. Stone chest four is actually the second from east. Already identified during the work of uncovering the first two, it was investigated later. It was deemed necessary first to shore up the adjoining property to the east. Its cover was similar in form and mass to the previous ones, and it too had an east-west orientation. A single inscribed plaque was found inside. It was shaped like a foot. To the west of the stone receptacles, and at a lower level, at a depth of 2.5 metres, another covering slab of similar dimensions and orientation was identified. Its outline was delimited by pebbles, while immediately south of it there was a pile of rough-hewn limestone. After investigation, we found that it covered two vessels instead of the expected one. This time, though, one vessel was of clay and the other of bronze. Both had been damaged by the weight of the massive cover. The clay vessel was a footless bell-shaped crater. Inside, 54 bronze tablets were found. These had been placed in approximately the same way with those in stone chest too, namely arranged around the sides of the vessel. Inside the bronze vase, which was spireleton, embossed with a hammer, and about 80 centimetres in diameter and height, three smaller bronze vessels were initially identified. One was a trefoil-shaped inokoi, and two were bowls. Under them were found the bones of two animals, which we initially thought were birds. The osteological study showed that one was indeed a bird, but the other was a rodent. Below the vases, too, were bronze tablets, but in a very poor state of preservation. The impression given by the finds in the bronze vessel, compared to the other retrieved, including the clay vessel, was that some of the tablets originally deposited were removed in such a way that it damaged the rest left inside it. In the eastern part of the plot, along the southern side and about half a metre deeper still than the foundation wall were the porous blocks, five clay vessels were found at depths ranging between 2.8 and 3.6 metres. These vessels were set upright and all had a cover. Four of them were made of a flat clay tile and the fifth of a thin limestone slab. All the pots were empty. The quality of their construction was extremely good. They were all wheel-made, four of them closed shapes. The last was an open form, identical to the one found next to the bronze vessel just mentioned. A sixth closed-shaped vessel was located east of the others. It could not be investigated because it was covered by the elevator shaft of the adjacent building. North of the clay vessels at the southern side, and at a slightly deeper level than their coverings, there was a floor of small-sized cobblestones of particularly elaborate construction and strongly packed together. This floor ran all across the area we investigated without any limits being encountered within the plot. In addition to the clay vessels of the southern side, the surface also surrounded the vessels that lay under cover five with a slope of approximately 15 centimetres from west down to the east and a depth of 10 centimetres, the base of the cobbled surface lay at a depth of 2.9 metres. At the eastern end of the plot, immediately east of Stone Chest 2, the floor texture changed gradually and without any sharp differentiation, turning into fine gravel-sized stones. The Stone Chest 2 had disturbed it slightly when fitted into position. In the southern and western parts of the plot, two tombs of the geometric period were identified, the covers of which were at a same or slightly deeper level than the cobbled floor just mentioned, namely at 2.62, 2.9 metres. The tombs, a built cyst and a pit with a limestone cover, were orientated east-west. 
They were richly endowed with pottery as well as metal objects, iron pins and bronze rings. According to the pottery, both tombs date to the Middle Geometric Era. From the detailed description of the excavation, it becomes clear that we have two sets of receptacles with a significant height difference between them. To show this more effectively, we drew a section along the east-west axis of the plot, east to left of image. It shows on one drawing both the finds on the central axis and those of the southern side. We may remark here that the upper preserved surface of wall 2 on the southern side is at a depth approximately of 1.95 metres, its base at a depth of 2.32 metres. The covers of the four stone chests vary little in height, 1.85-205 metres, and are located in the same plane and slightly lower than the top of the south wall. The massive receptacles themselves sit about one metre deeper, at a level of 2.8 to 2.85 metres. They either rest directly on the pebble floor, stone chest 3 and 4, or in soil a little above it, stone chest 1. Only in one case, stone chest 2, was the floor slightly disturbed as observed before. The pebbly floor itself that covers the entire surface of the area we investigated is at a level of 2.71 metres to 2.85 metres, with a slight slope down to the east. In two places it has clearly been breached, in order to place the two vases, clay and metal, under cover plate 5 on the one hand, and the six clay vases on the southern side on the other. The covers of the geometric tombs, on the other hand, are at approximately the same or at a slightly lower level than the pebble floor. Now let's take a look at the horizontal and vertical stratigraphy of the plot, together with the pottery and the other small finds made. At a depth of 2.9 to 3 metres, the natural alluvial bedrock is located, sterile of archaeological finds. On this is a layer of brown soil about 10 centimetres thick, containing pottery of the late Middle Helladic period in good preservation. The sherds are not worn. Their condition allows us to consider that the pottery was not brought here from another location. The pebbly floor was set on top of this stratum. Above the pebbly floor, a relatively hard brown soil is found in the western part of the plot up to about 1.5 metres. In the eastern part of the plot, the soil has strong admixtures of fine gravel. In the case of six empty clay vessels on the south side, this layer seems to be responsible for the partial destruction of the cover and part of the rim of one of them. The pottery in both layers, and indeed all soils, from about 1.5 metres down to 2.7 deep, the pebble floor level, presents the following picture. Close to the stone chests, the stone piles and built walls, the pottery consists of at least 90% decorated proto-geometric and geometric sherds of very good quality, as well as plenty of handmade geometric material in little worn condition. The remaining 10% consist of earlier sherds of the late Middle Helladic periods, as well as some from the later Archaic and Classical periods up to approximately the first half of the 4th century BC. Apart from these ceramics, a small number of fragments of figurines from the Archaic era were also found scattered in the layers. None can be safely associated with any of the massive structures or receptacles. Above these two layers, the pure brown and the gravelly one, and where the contexts were not disturbed by the modern building that existed there before the beginning of the excavation, a layer of river alluvial material of gravel was observed relatively similar to that noted in the eastern sector, though of a slightly larger grain size. The layer, slightly hard to tell apart from the other, as both are gravels, covers the two underlying ones. In the western part of the plot, it merges into the brown one, having also removed a part of the southern wall. This layer contains but a few sherds, very worn, water-tumbled. 
Let us now see how all these elements can be evaluated to establish the temporal sequence of the uses of the space. As the layer under the pebbly floor attests, the area was inhabited for the first time in the late Middle Helladic period. The ground level was then approximately three metres lower than today. The Middle Helladic settlement preserved no architectural remains here. In the Middle Geometric times, a floor of extremely elaborate construction was laid down, which surrounded at least two tombs of the same period, both richly endowed. Both the costly creation of the floor and the expensive contents of the tombs indicate that the space was reserved for burial use, possibly by a distinguished family of the upper social class. Much later on, the space was used for the setting through the geometric floor of two vessels, one of clay, the other of metal, in which inscribed plaques were placed and that were then covered with a huge limestone slab. Moreover, a little further to the east, at least six clay vessels were treated in the same way. Held by the stable natural soils, together with a solid cobble floor, these last acquired a stable position. The attribution of the two assemblages, the clay and metal alongside the six clay vases, to the same moment in time is confirmed not only by their levels and manner of placement, but also by the striking similarity of the clay vessel under cover 5 to clay vessel 5 at the south bulk. These vases, both closed and open, are, as far as I know, unknown to the ceramic repertoire of Argos. However, an open vase, very similar to the pair from the Zbineos plot, was recently identified by Jutta Strotchek in the Keramikos of Athens. It comes from an olive crushing mill and dates to the 5th century BC. Perhaps those in Argos were a special order to meet the needs of some particular use. As the finds attest, the cover slab 5 was withdrawn at least once after the tablets were placed inside the vessels on an occasion when some of those inside bronze leaves were hastily or violently removed and the two bowls and the jug of metal put in. Although these last two metal vessels could have been in their original use ceremonial, it seems that they were placed in the cauldron either as valuable vessels for safekeeping or even for storing into them coined money. The bones of the animals recovered might also imply some ritual action, but in fact, we do not choose to so interpret them. Rather, we see them as the result of some contemporary rodent that had dragged its victim down into the soft soil that had accumulated in the vessel, and there perished too. The next event in the sequence was a river flooding episode that deposited over a metre of sediment on the site, and so raised the ground surface from 2.6 to 2.7 at least one and a half metres below the current surface level. It seems that at the time of the flood, the vessels on the south bank were empty, either because they had never been used, or because at the time, for some reason, they had no contents. Apparently, immediately after the flood, the five stone chests were placed in the accumulated sediment east and north of the space previously occupied by the two earlier sets of vases. After the placement of the stone chests, at least the two vessels under cover five were still in use. Within the same layer, and apparently not by chance, a metal kiln was constructed immediately west of the area of cover five. Clay mould pieces found dumped to its south indicate its purpose. These moulds have a rectangular shape, with a relatively shallow depression on one surface. They are made of a reddish local clay with inclusions. In places they retain traces of a black discoloration. It is impossible not to connect the shape and size of the concave impression of the mould, especially the camphor made to one narrow end, with the shape of some tablets which have a similar bevel at one end. The upper surface, as well as the basal level of this thin feature, is at much the same depth as the underside of the covers of the stone chests. This and the fact that the kiln was set into the same alluvial lever as the stone chests 
lead us to conclude that the kiln and the stone chests are approximately contemporary and certainly later than the flood. The wall at the south side of the plot, as well as the return wall and the piles of stones, not projected onto the coloured section, are at the same level and so too will be approximately contemporary with the insertion of the stone chests. And while the stone chests and the kiln occupy a space where no structures existed at a lower level before the flood occurred, the eastern part of the wall of the south side is built over the spot where the clay vessels on the south side were earlier placed. At this point, it is useful to collate the evidence of the pottery and the other small finds with the larger structures to explain what was going on in this place down the years. The abundant protogeometric and geometric pottery, and especially the high percentage of handmade vessels, must mark debris from habitation contexts surrounding the tomb area, in a pattern now confirmed in Tiryns and elsewhere in Argos. This pottery marks a terminus post quem for the flood. The small percentage of pottery recovered from the archaic and classical times may indicate a change in the use of the site. Maybe it ceased to be used for habitation and burials after geometric times. The few figurines perhaps indicate a new use in the archaic period, perhaps with some cultic component to it. The dating of some of the tablets, probably at the end of the 5th century BC, and the dating of the rest, mainly in the first half of the 4th century BC, offers a terminus antiquem for the first use of this space, for the insertion of the vases as storage receptacles for the tablets. Then came the flood, and covered the vessels with a deposit of more than one metre. But the same use of the space was continued. Of the original vessels, only the bronze and the clay vessel under cover five at the western end were reused. Rather, new stone chests were preferred for the continuing deposition of tablets, which process lasted until the middle of the 4th century BC, as confirmed by their dating by Haralambos Kritzas. Thus, from the evidence analysed so far, I believe it becomes clear that the area was used in antiquity first for habitation in the Middle Helladic period, then for burials and habitation in the geometric era, and finally, in classical times, for the storage of the bronze-inscribed tablets in vessels especially intended for this use. The question that automatically now arises is simple but vital. Where were these containers of precious public documents being kept? If we return to the plan view of the uppermost level of finds, we can make some interesting observations. We have already interpreted the remains of the series of porous stone resting on cobblestones to the south and east of the plot as the basis of walls. The stone receptacles and the kiln, as well as the cover plate 5, are all located on a single axis orientated east-west which is parallel to the south wall and is about two and a half metres away from it. At about the same distance to the north of this line of features, more rough-hewn limestone stones and cobblestones have been identified. Though they do not have much cohesion, they do run on an east-west axis. The other stone piles, as well as the porous slabs recovered between the two axes, have a physical relationship to the position of the stone chests and cover plate 5. The impression given on this coloured plan is that the storage area with the vessels and the kiln is delimited by a simple structure, namely two long east-west walls surviving to a maximum length of 9 metres and a transverse one made of different materials. The northern and part of the southern wall lines were damaged by flooding. Despite the simple construction, we can see in what remains of the foundations the outline of a building that may have had an entrance from the east that ended in pilasters. The form of the Templum in Antis is that of the treasures that were dedicated in the great Panhellenic sanctuaries. Bafsanias assures us that such were used to protect valuable offerings 
that were not set up in the open air so as to prevent them from becoming worn or stolen. Inside this building at Argos, I believe that we can recognise in the stone pile remnants the construction substrates marking where the receptacles would have been buried, leaving at best the covering plate protruding. The kiln at the western end is the only secure element for calculating the ground surface of this phase. It is significant that it is set at the same level as the upper surface of the stone chests in that it supports the above view. The two stone piles at the inside of the north and south walls respectively can perhaps also be considered as substrates for wall buttresses or for specific reinforcements of the roof, although the small width of the building does not require a colonnade to support the roof structure. And now we naturally come to the final question. Where would this building be located in relation to the urban fabric of the classical era and the public and religious spaces of the city? The site of the plot is quite far off, approximately 900 metres, and to the northeast of the theatre and the agora. It sits in an area that has not yielded any special archaeological findings and in fact was considered to be outside the city walls. The discovery of this Midnaeus plot now strongly refutes this view. As the texts of the tablets themselves demonstrated, both these and the gold were kept in the sanctuary of Pallas. Such a structure could not have been located in any desolate, uninhabited and isolated area. The orientation of the graves as well as the storage containers with the tablets indicate the existence of an east-west road nearby. Moreover, from other excavations we know that along the present Corinth Street there was indeed a central road on a north-south direction. It is reasonable to envision an entrance into the city near which the sanctuary of Pallas would have been located. This would encompass the wider surroundings immediate to the present house plot. The cessation of the use of the space for the storage of tablets must be placed in the middle of the 4th century BC, a fact confirmed by the absence of any later small finds. For some reason that cannot be deduced from the excavation findings, stone chests cease to be used as storage receptacles for the precious tablets. Curiously, a large number of them were left abandoned there to be preserved to this day. Perhaps some political reshuffles resulted in the abolition of the system of openly recording the management of public money. The fact that Pafsanias does not mention a sanctuary that can topographically be identified with the plot we have investigated is probably due to the fact that it no longer existed in the 2nd century AD when he visited Argos. Today's presentation marks the completion of a cycle witnessing the efforts of public officials to save and study these unique original written sources from the past, as well as to communicate the historical realities they record. The Greek state and the Ministry of Culture and Sports have already secured funding for the creation of a special epigraphic museum in the historical complex of the Kapodistria barracks in Argos. There, will be returned and exhibited these precious finds, the bronze tablets of Argos, to be an everlasting and eloquent witness to Argive democratic institutions.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, good afternoon. Firstly, I would like to thank the President, Dr. Theodoropoulou, and the Council of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK for the great honor of this invitation to share with you an extraordinary epigraphic discovery made in Argos. I also thank my colleagues, the then effort of the Ephorate of Antiquities of the Argolite, Mrs. Elizabeth Spathari, and the excavator, Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou, who kindly entrusted me with the study and publication of this unique material. Finally, I warmly thank the conservators who managed to extract exactly and to restore these valuable but extremely fragile findings. Dr. Papadimitriou has given you a comprehensive description of the circumstances of discovery and of the careful excavation and safe extraction of the plaques from their ancient containers. The plaques were then gradually transported to the Epigraphical Museum of Athens for restoration and study. I was then the director of that museum, where a laboratory for restoration has been set up. The very expert conservator of antiquities, Tassos Magnisalis, worked for almost nine years with exceptional devotion on the restoration of the plaques in close cooperation with me. The method that was employed was a combination of mechanical cleaning with the use of ultrasounds and microhydrogen. Then the slow drying in a special oven, the covering with isolating varnish, finally the fixing of a green plastic net and in some cases of sticks of plexiglass as support on the backside of the plaques. This very delicate and time-consuming operation was mostly carried out under the stereomicroscope. Some plaques were nearly complete or were broken into large pieces. Other plaques have been reconstructed from hundreds of tiny pieces selected from among thousands of fragments. The total number of the inscribed tablets is 134, and we have managed to read and transcribe equal number of texts. The shapes and the dimensions of the plaques vary. Almost no one is absolutely rectangular. Some are like pages measuring 40 by 30 centimeters. Others have the form of bands or are trapezoidal. Very often an angle is cut obliquely. Some plaques are perforated at some point. Initially we thought that this was designed for fixing them onto some surface, most probably that of a public building, as in the case of the architraves of the Agora of Argos, where traces of similar plaques are still evident. But in one case, a concretion of seven perforated sheets tied together with a bronze wire in the shape of a ring was found. Their study proved that their content was homogeneous. It seems then that in fact the holes were used for tying the sheets together and for storing them in bunches. The plaques are written in the repoussé technique, that is, the letters were struck with chisels on the back side of the sheet, the verso, from right to left, so that they could be read in relief on the front side, the recto, from left to right. Several texts from the stone chest proved to be palimpsests. We distinguished many hands of different cutters, in some cases even within the same document. It seems that the habit of writing on bronze plaques was very old and common in Argos. This practice explains the relative rarity of early inscriptions on stone from that city. There is a literary reference indicating that the Argive historian Akusilaos had compiled his genealogies based on bronze writing tablets, Halkas Veltus, found by his father when digging in his property. According to Plutarch, another Argive historian, Socrates, mentioned that the Argives used to write on bronze tablets and the Therais Halkais. In English, I use the terms plaques or tablets for the inscribed metal sheets. In ancient Greek, they were usually called pinakes, deltoi, halkia or halkomata, 
but in our case, the texts themselves gave us the then current appellation in Argos, which was the Lamones Halkei. As for the types of containers in which the plaques were stored, the texts seem to call a bronze vase Tolecos, same root as that of Lecani, basin. Whereas the stone chests are called Petroi, singular of Petros, the stone chests were individually numbered 1st, 3rd, 4th Petros, etc. There are many literary testimonia about the practice of hiding texts in the earth. Two are noteworthy for our purposes. Pausanias describes the most venerated Petroma at the sanctuary of Dimitir Kidaria at Pheneos, consisting of two large hollow stones fitted one to the other. When every other year they celebrated the so-called greater rites, they opened these stones to take writings from them that refer to the rites, and then they would read them to the initiated and return them on the same night. A real example of such a petroma was found at the sanctuary of Demeter at Eleusis. Posanias also narrates the case of the archive general Epitelis, who in 369 BC, when Epaminondas was about to found Messini, was bidden by a dream to dig at a certain point on Ithomi, where he found a brazen urn. In it was some tin foil rolled like a scroll. On it were inscribed the mysteries of the great goddesses. But the closest real archaeological parallel to our chests is the cylindrical stone case at the sanctuary of Olympian Zeus in Locri Epizephyri. Its cover weighs 1,200 kilos, and in it were found 39 bronze tablets inscribed with financial accounts. All our tablets are written in the Argive Epicoric alphabet. They are composed in the Doric dialect of the Argolid, and they preserve many idioms and a great number of words and proper names that were unattested until now. The numerical system is the so-called mixed acrophonic system of Argos, represented on the plaques by a complete range of symbols, from the myriad, 10,000, to the halkus, one twelfth of obol. On the basis of paleographic criteria, the majority of the texts could be dated towards the end of the 5th century BC. But internal evidence obliges us to lower the dating to roughly the first half of the 4th century. This crucial period includes the events of the Corinthian War, 394-386 BC, the defeat of the Spartans at Leutrak, 371 BC, the war at Fleus, the civil strife in Argos that led to the bloody events of the Scitalismos, 370, the invasions of the Thebans and their allies in Lacunia in the same year, the temporary dictatorship of Euphron in Sicyon, circa 368-366 BC, and other events which are reflected in the new texts. All the documents are financial accounts. They comprise part of the archives of the sanctuary of Pallas Athena, which, in accordance with common practice, served as the central bank of the state. The style is dry and almost telegraphic. The magistrates could withdraw money in the form of loans to meet the various needs of the state, but then they had to repay these loans either in cash or in the form of dedications or constructions at the sanctuary of Ira. Our texts used expressions Catethen and Ston Petron Parpalavi, they deposited money in the Petros at the treasury of Pallas, and Elondo Ectu Petru Parpalados, they withdrew money out of the Petros from the treasury of Pallas. It is possible that the site where the tablets were found was an annex of the sanctuary of Pallas, which is a sanctuary known only from epigraphic evidence.
Pallas Athena was the old patroness of Argos before Ira undertook this role in the mid 5th century BC. This is why even the money of Ira was deposited in the treasury of Pallas, as happened with the money of the other gods in the Parthenon. Although it may sound curious, it seems that the chests themselves and the various vases covered with very heavy slabs were a kind of primitive strong box or thesavroi, as for example the built thesaurus of the Asclepiaeon at Lebina, Crete, and many others. Gold and silver were deposited in these petroi either as raw metals Chrysion or Argyrion Avergon, or in numismatic form, Argyrion Nomismatus. Not surprisingly, no money was found in the stone chests, but a piece of the golden wire was preserved among the bronze tablets in the bronze cauldron. Perhaps more impressive is the discovery of gold dust stuck on the surface of the corroded plaques. Many dozens of tiny granules were collected, almost invisible to the naked eye, which are called by the Delian inscriptions Psychomatia. We know from ancient sources that gold was sometimes stored in the form of granules. The narration of Herodotus 625 is characteristic. When Chrysus invited to Sardis the Athenian Alcmaeon, the founder of the aristocratic Athenian family of the Alcmeonids, he allowed him to enter into his treasury, where, among many other valuables, a heap of gold dust was also stored. I don't wish to speculate, but I should mention that at exactly the time of our inscriptions, a large amount of gold was sent to Greece as a component of the Persian propaganda campaign and we know that the archives were among those who received a part of that gold. In any case, it seems that Argos was prosperous at that period. As for the provenance of her wealth, our inscribed texts, combined with literary sources, lead to the conclusion that the main source of archive prosperity might have been the income from the rich archive plain and from the adjacent pastures. At this point, a short historical parenthesis would be useful. After the reign of Phaedon, Argos, in the archaic period, was an aristocratic society of landlords and warriors. Her predominance declined in the face of the increasing power of Sparta, her eternal enemy. Around 550 BC, Argos lost the coastal area of the Thyreatis, but the battle with Sparta that was more decisive for the history of Argos took place about 494 BC at Sapia near Tiridis. There, the Spartan king Cleomenes defeated the Argive army and some 6,000 men lost their lives. The city of Argos itself was not occupied by the Spartans, but the power of Argos was neutralized. That was the reason or a good excuse for Argos not participating in the Persian Wars, a stance which brought upon the Argives the charge of medicine and increased their political isolation. Even more, because of her weakness, Argos was unable to retain control over the Argolid. In that circumstance, some subordinate cities like Mycenae and Tiryns encouraged by Sparta, took the opportunity to declare their independence. Mycenae also took control of the great sanctuary of Ira near Argos. But the so-called Servile Interregnum soon ended and the recovery of Argos was spectacular. All the cities of the plain, including Mycenae and Tiryns, were occupied and transformed into Burks, Comae, of Argos. Their inhabitants were either expelled or incorporated into the political body of the state, which was thus reinforced. The regime changed into a moderate democracy, and in order to break down the old structures, 
a repartition of the citizens into probably 48 fratres took place. The fratres were divided into the four tribes of Argos, Hilais, Pamphylae, Dumanes, and Irnathioi. The occupied lands were confiscated or consecrated to the main divinities of the Argolid as Iera Caidamosia Hora, sacred and public land. The total land was divided into lots, Kiai, which produced rents, Dotinai, or other income. Part of the land, in accordance with a common practice, was allotted to the fratres for exploitation and to meet their needs. In this way, the income from the land constituted the main revenue of the state. It was deposited into the treasury of Ira, which was kept in the treasuries of Pallas. Other resources, according to our texts, were the interest from land money, tokos, the tithe dedicated to Hira, the kata iras, the booty from war, money from the sale of confiscated properties, money from penalties and fines of any kind, the revenues from the sacred flocks and from the sale of the hides of sacrificed animals. As concerns the expenses, the purpose of the withdrawals is not always specified. On the evidence of the texts, we can distinguish two main categories of expenses, those for the sanctuary and the festivals, and those designated to cover various needs of the state. In the first category belong the following expenses. For the festivals and the games in honor of Ira, for the construction of cult objects, including the cult statue of ivory and gold, for the erection of the new temple and other constructions at the sanctuary and the hippodrome, for general expenses for the cult, poi tans da panans, the salaries of workmen and of the shepherds of the sacred flocks, for the engraving of the accounts themselves on telamones, and other minor expenses. And in the second category, the state withdrew money for these expenses. For the war, Piton Polemon, for its general expenses in the form of loans, Metrimata. Let us see now the various titles of magistrates and state officials who are involved in these diverse transactions. The evidence of the new inscriptions on that matter is invaluable, since works such as the Constitution of Argos of Aristotle are lost. Please note that the generic term denoting any kind of magistrates or official committees in Argos is artina, plural e artinae. A previously unattested magistracy is the epignoma, composed of eight synepignomones two from each tribe. Since the epignoma is shown depositing and giving money, it seems that it was a kind of managing committee of the sacred and public land. Furthermore, the epignoma undertakes from time to time the exact counting of the money and other valuables kept in the treasury. A major role was played by the already known body of the eighty, Ogdoeconda. They are always mentioned first, and they had financial and judicial powers. Now we learn that they alternated acting in groups of ten, the caves, decuries, with the cadarchos above nine syndecadees. The four Iaromnamones and Sheran, one from each tribe, though they were civilians and not members of the clergy, constituted the supreme religious authority. They were mostly responsible for the great works at the sanctuary and for the consecration of money coming from the sale of confiscated properties of condemned citizens. Their office was annual and they alternated as presidents every third month. The four Abethlothetai were responsible for the organization of the Havethla, the games in honor of Ira, 
called in this period Ekatomvua, later Iraya, and finally Exarus Aspis. The prizes were weapons or luxury utensils of bronze. The Artina Tasipafesios was responsible for the construction of the mechanism of the starting post of the hippodrome. We knew that the famous games of Argos included horse and chariot races, and we have had epigraphic testimonies about the race course. Posanias describes in detail the epiphysis, the starting post of Olympia, work of the Athenian Cleoitas. It was to the south of the stadium and had the shape of the prow of a ship with its ram turned towards the course. An intricate mechanism ensured the staggered opening of the race course boxes. It is very possible that there was a similar construction in Argos too. Coming back to the bodies of magistrates, we have the previously unattested anelatires. The term is from the verb anelao anelavno and means those who drive away, who persecute, probably debtors or people who were required to pay fines. Another unattested magistracy are the odoteres, probably related to odos and the verb odo, to lead by the right way. Perhaps they were responsible for the construction and maintenance of the road network, a duty particularly important during a wartime period. The five generals, Stratagoi, one from each tribe, plus one from the elite corps, were known. Now we learn that in the early 4th century they were also responsible for the cavalry and that they already also had civil duties. We know nothing about the 500 Pentacatioi. Were they a military body of elites or judges? The Krithohitai and the Sitopumbi might be related to the supply, especially of the army, of cereals and other food provisions and their distribution. Other minor artinae were those responsible for the expenses, Epitas Dapanans, the artinae of the Agora, the artina for the maintenance and the security of the Petroi, the artina for the censer, the Thymiatirion, a luxury utensil for the manufacture of which four minas of Sicilian silver coins were melted down, the artina for the drinking cups, Don Potirion, responsible for the manufacture of gold and silver cups for the ceremonial banquets during the festivals. These ceremonial banquets took place in a special building at the Iraeon. The texts mention a withdrawal of 13,626 silver drachmas for that purpose, as well as gold caps weighing 48 drachmas and silver caps weighing 42,058 drachmas, almost 256.5 kilograms. It seems that besides their utilitarian character, all these luxury objects were also a kind of investment in precious metals, and they were also a means of exhibiting the wealth of the city to the visitors who arrived as theoroi for the festivals of era. Other artinae are even more consequential. I remind you that the old temple of Ira was burnt in 423 BC due to the negligence of the priestess. We believed until now that the construction of the new temple had started almost immediately after the fire and that it was completed before the end of the 5th century. We must review this belief after the new evidence. The texts mention a board of magistrates called Domatopioi and Heran, which means those who supervised the construction of the Doma, the new temple of the goddess, a work of the Argive architect Eupolemos. The Domatopioi take coined money from the treasury and also gold in the form of very thin leaves, petalia, 
for gilding architectural details of the temple. The board even brings back clippings, peritmimata of gold leaves, to be remelted. The gilding of the architectural details indicates that the temple was in its final phases of construction, and for this we have another strong evidence. The texts mention a committee called Artina ton Thiromaton, the Artina for the Great Door. They withdraw from the treasury the considerable amount of 14,000 silver drachmas for the main gate of the temple, measuring 6 by 3, 50 meters. It might be constructed from expensive woods with incrustations of ivory and precious metals like the great door of the temple of Asclepius at Epidaurus. It is possible that all these fine works were made in a special building called to Efxoideion. The term from F and Xeo is otherwise unattested and means the workshop for fine carving. Such workshops existed at almost all the great sanctuaries, especially during building or other works. The best known is the famous workshop of Phidias at Olympia, in which he constructed the colossal statue of Zeus of gold and ivory, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Remarkably, the new texts offer us, for the first time, evidence for another masterpiece of ancient art, the Chryselephantine statue of Ira of Argos. More specifically, the texts refer to a board of magistrates called Hedopoioi and Iran, those who are responsible for the construction of the Edos, the seated statue of the goddess. A vague idea of what the Argive statue looked like is given to us by Posenius. The goddess was represented seated on a throne, the statue was five meters high, and with its pedestal it reached the head of eight meters. Hera held a pomegranate in one hand and the scepter with the other. She wore a golden diadem on which the Harites and the Horai were represented in relief. One inscription on stone found in the past mentions that she wore a valuable necklace and that a purple mantle was offered to her like the peplos to Athena. Besides her statue stood a smaller statue of Hebe, of gold and ivory too. Of course we must not picture that colossal statue as being of solid gold and ivory. It had a wooden core overlaid with gold leaves, her ears, the naked parts were covered by thin sheets of ivory tinted to give the illusion of human flesh. The Hedopioi of our inscription withdraw from the treasury 10,000 drachmas in one case, as well as raw gold weighing about 19.280 kilograms. In another case, they deposit thin leaves of gold, petalia, weighing 10 minas, 4 drachmas, and 1 obol, which they bought for the statue, poi to edos. This was not, of course, all the quantity of gold for the statue. The archives are not fully preserved and our information is fragmentary. Just for comparison, I remind you that the statue of Phidias' Athena Parthenos had 44 talents of gold, almost 1,153 kilograms, whereas its total cost was more than 705 talents. Ancient tradition attributed the statue of Ira to the famous Argive sculptor Polycletus the Elder, although Plinius does not mention it among his works. But towards the end of the 5th century, Polycletus might have been almost 90 years old, and it would have been very difficult for him to undertake such a laborious task. This is why various scholars already in the 1950s proposed the attribution of the statue to Polycletus the Younger, who was active mostly in the first quarter of the 4th century BC. 
our texts reinforce this view. The statue might have been finished shortly before 370 and the archives, very proud of the masterpiece of their sanctuary, struck new silver coins just after the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC. The coins carry a simplified representation of the head of Ira on the obverse and Diomedes carrying the Xoanon of Pallas, Palladeion, on the reverse. In order to better evaluate the context in which these works were created, we must always keep in mind that they were realized during the intervals between the conflicts of the Corinthian War and of the civil troubles in Argos, which ended with the massacre of the oligarchs at the so-called Skitalismos in 370. Our texts are quite detailed about activities of the democracy. A decree of the People's Assembly, Aliea, allows the use of the sacred treasure for war purposes. The generals receive 46,000 drachmas for that purpose. The Aromnamones, on the other hand, deposit at the sacred treasury the money collected from the selling of confiscated properties which most probably belonged to the oligarchs. Democracy was firmly established in Argos. The various magistracies were semestrial, so that more citizens could share in the power. The tribes and the fratres rotated in the various offices. New citizens from the annexed Kome, Burgs, were incorporated into the fratre and had rights equal to those of the existing citizen population. Furthermore, there was an absolute transparency in administering the wealth of the state. For every transaction, besides the artine that we mentioned, representatives of the other magistracies might also be present in order to guarantee and to legitimate the transaction by their presence. We have representatives of the council, Vola, of the polemarchs, of the damiorgoi, and also of two magistracies unattested until now, the 600, Vexakatioi, and the Spondodike. Perhaps the 600 were a kind of small assembly known as Singlitos, something between the council and the great people's assembly, dictated by the war conditions. The Spondodike might be the negotiators for the truce, the Sponde. Their presence indicates that we are rather towards the end of the Corinthian War. And democracy is inevitably bureaucratic. I estimated that the tablets of just one chest mention about 522 persons. This is a real treasure, not only because the prosopography of Argos is greatly enriched, but also because many unattested names are added to Greek onomastics. Besides the personal names and sometimes the patronymics, the other components of the political identity of the Argive citizens, the so-called nomenclature, included also the name of the fratra and or the name of the burg, comma, to which a particular citizen belonged. We have learned some ten new names of fratre the total now reaching the number of 48, 12 per tribe. Also some 40 names of Argive Kome are attested epigraphically for the first time. This is a valuable contribution to the historic geography, although we are not always able to fix their exact location. Extremely important is the mention of some Kome of the Thyreates, North Kinuria, such as Eva, Isea, and Niris. Until now, it had generally been believed that their annexation to Argus took place after the Battle of Chironea of 338 BC. Now we have evidence that this happened much earlier, around 370. We also have evidence that the city of Cleone was annexed to Argos between 390 and 380 BC. 
thus the territory of the state of Argos at the beginning of the fourth century, started from the frontier with the Corinthia, close to the modern village of Agios Vasilios, included the areas of Cleone of Nemea, the mountains west of Lius, the plain of Argos, and the surrounding mountains. It also included North Kinuria, the Thyreatis, modern Ligurio, and a part of the Arachneon mountain, and reached to the south of modern Kilada at the Hermionid. Let me just say a few words concerning the calendar. Argos, as almost all ancient cities, had a lunar calendar of 12 months, to which an intercalary month was added almost every third year for correspondence with the solar year. We have learned three names of months that were missing. These are Agrianius, Artamitius, and Erytheos. In red. The first is related to the feast of Agriania in honor of the dead. Artamitius is the month of the goddess Artemis. Erythaios is related to Erythos, harvest, and Erythoi, the laborers of the land. Let me finish this presentation by reading some texts. The first is a decree of the People's Assembly which approved the use of sacred money for war purposes. Aliea edoxe telia, eleste tu argiriu parpalados tu tas iras, ton sogdoikonda, is egrafe cleodamos ke aristeas, areteve nikis volas lesva. Resolved by the regular assembly that the eighty for whom Cleodamus and Aristeas served as secretaries, withdrew from the money of Ira out of the treasury of Pallas 6,000 drachmas of silver. President of the council was Nikis from the coma Lessa. Ellon do Tiogdoi condaec tu Petru, ceteale artine, poi ton polemon. The eighty and the other authorities withdrew money from the stone chest for the war. Presidents were the following. Then follow the names of the presidents of the various magistracies. The second text is an account for the sacred money used for the expedition to Corinth. Tiogdoikonda, kete artine te vexamenu. Elundo argirion parpalados totas iras, ta stratea ta en Corinthi. The eighty and the other authorities of the semester withdrew from the treasury of Pallas the money of Ira for the expedition at Corinth. Then follow the names of the presidents of various magistracies. And at the end we have the total. 18,660 drachmae of silver. The third text is an account for the cult statue. Elondo ti edopioi tu chrysiu ek tu petru poi to edos, triakonda mnans mien, pentikonda drachmans enea, tetoras odelons. The magistrates responsible for the construction of the cult statue withdrew from the stone chest gold weighing 31 minas, 59 drachmas, and 4 obols. As you can see, the weight of gold is written in full letters and not in numerals. Then follow again the names of the residents of the magistracies. The fourth text is an account for the great door. Helomes, Artina Thiromaton, Miria Pentacosia, Areteve Iaromnamonon Nasithios Lycophronidas, etc. We, that is to say the Iaromnamones, withdrew for the authority responsible for the construction of the great door of the temple 10,500 drachmas. President of the Ieromnamones was Mnasithios Lycophronidas, and then follow the names of the other magistrates. (music) 
I hope this necessarily detailed presentation was not too tiring. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Papadimitriou and Mr. Kridzas, for your vivid, informative, and well-structured presentation of these unique finds. I now have the honor of inviting Professor Robert Parker to give the vote of thanks. Professor Parker, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, well, during a long career in Oxford, <clears throat> I have attended countless seminars and I've forgotten almost everything about almost all of them. But one that I've never forgotten and never will, as long as I have some memory left, is the one at which Mr. Kuitzas presented us the first results of the spectacular discovery of these Argive tablets. It's a very well-known fact that the study of Greek history before the rise of Macedon has been, is necessarily dominated by study of Athens and Sparta, because these are the only two states whose political systems students are ever asked to write about, uh, because of course they're the only states we know anything much about. A distinguished German historian, in fact, coined the expression, the third Greek world, to refer to Greece beyond Athens and Sparta, the neglected historiogra historiographically underprivileged states. Well, in thanking Mr. Kuitzas after that lecture he gave in Oxford, I said that we could look forward to the day when students were also going to be set examination questions on the political system, on the internal affairs of Argos. Argos can raise itself out of the third Greek world. I think one can say that what the discovery of Aristotle's Athenaeon Politeia was for Athens, that the discovery of these tablets has been for Argos. But there is one big difference here. As far as I know, the papyrus of the Constitution of the Athenians of Aristotle didn't pose any special difficulties of decipherment or of preservation, whereas the Argos tablets have been, in many cases, just as difficult to deal with as they are precious. It's been wonderful and exciting to hear today, well, first about the detailed context of the find, um, and then also about, we've had some hints about the progress that's been made with this exceptionally difficult, but also exceptionally exciting material the way in which it's shed history, uh, shed new light on so many aspects of the internal workings of Argos. We've heard details about Argive finances, about resources, about expenses, about all the magistracies they had. 12 separate boards of magistrates, including the mysteriously named drivers away, about the difficult political bodies through which Argive political life was spread out, about the detailed financing of temple building. We've heard more about the workings of Argive democracy, about the way they were concerned for transparency, um, about the role of euthune, of audit. We've heard about the new phratries and new tomai that are now attested in Argos, and also about new names born by individuals. Um, we've heard also about the extent of Argive territory and about the Argive calendar. And these are just a few, I think, of the innumerable extraordinary things that have come out um, from these wonderful tablets, the brilliant excavation and then the wonderful devoted attention to them by Dr. Kuitzas and his team in uh, making them legible, not easy material at all. Um, exciting news too about the uh, 
new museum which is to be built to house these finds. So I mustn't say any more, um, but let us all join in expressing our huge thanks to both our speakers for their talks today and still more for the extraordinary contribution they've made to the study of Greek history by their devoted and brilliant and extremely successful labors. Thank you indeed. A heartfelt thank you and a big round of applause for our speakers, Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou and Mr. Haralambos Kridzas for their splendid presentation. If you wish to join us or contact us, make a donation or be on our emailing list. All information is on the screen now and the copy can be found on chat, which you can, can download. Help us to help young promising archeologists to fulfill their dreams and give them opportunities for a better future. Thank you all for attending this evening. <laughs>